today, I want to talk about a man who confused everybody. He was conservative. Conservative? Yes. Well, no. Well, maybe. Maybe not. Liberal? It would seem so. Oh, maybe not. Certainly he was a liberal. But on second thought, no. See what I mean? He put everyone in a tailspin trying to figure out where he stood on things. After a while, he was the talk of the town. At first, some seemed amused at his apparent fickleness. But soon they were downright mad at him. After watching him carefully for a good period of time, people noticed a consistent pattern. Yes, yes, there was a consistent rhythm to his life. Watch him for a while. And what will you see? With regard to his own relationship to God, he was an absolute conservative. With his prayer life, oh yes, he was a solid conservative. Sometimes he, he was observed praying all night, all night until the, beer, the dew was, a, was forming on his beard. Yes, a consistent pattern of friendship with his Father in heaven. He was zealous for God's word, yes. It seems that even at the age of 12, he knew more than the scholars down there in Jerusalem. Yes, he was a conservative there, but he's definitely jealous for the truth, for sure. Let's see what his life, let's, let's see, what is his lifestyle like? For sure, he's not lazy. He's serious about his work. He's no foolish jesting and joking. Yes, a real conservative. But when it comes to the failings of others, wow, he seems to be a liberal. Amen. While others condemn. He defends and forgives those who do wrong. And as I read the Bible, I watched one day, and he's conservative to, imply, to apply justice to himself, but liberal in exercising mercy to others. We all know who I'm talking about, don't we? Conservative in personal obedience to God's word, but liberal in patience and mercy for others who fail to do the same. Yes, as I watch, I notice something. He's consistent in all these things. His life, his teaching match a conservative, but his love and mercy look like a liberal. Before long, the townspeople got so angry at his conservative liberal ways that they crucified him on a cruel Roman cross. According to the conservative Pharisees, Jesus was far too liberal. He's far too liberal to be out there teaching people. He had a habit of condemning they had a, a pattern, I'm sorry, of condemning sinners. Jesus was in the habit of forgiving them. The conservative Pharisees, Pharisees were in the habit of lifting their noses out to the outcasts of society, no doubt holding their self-righteous breath as they hurried by so they wouldn't be contaminated with the air that they were walking through. Can you see them doing that? He was in the habit of dining with publicans and sinners and putting an affirming hand upon their shoulders and pronouncing blessings on those who were unfortunate. And on the contrary, he didn't fit with the liberal Sadducees either. They had no, little respect for the inspired writings except when it brought political advantage or pushed a favored agenda that they might have. Truth for them had to push the cart or they didn't believe it. But Jesus quoted the scriptures continually, fluently, and exalted every word of God as inspired. The Sadducees loved to be served by the more common folk, and Jesus loved to serve the common folk. 
They grasped for power and money, and Jesus possessed none of the world's wealth or, and, or power, and he wanted neither, neither did he have any. He had not even a place to lay his head. The Pharisees and Sadducees were opposites in this society. The Pharisees to the far right, the Sadducees to the far left. So, of course, they didn't get along very well. They were often entangled in fine points of doctrine and lifestyle issues. They had one thing in common, however. They hated each other. So in a roundabout way, they were of the same spirit, right? That's why it was natural for them to, to unite against Jesus and his work. They were both united in that, weren't they? Those leaders saw Jesus saw in Jesus what they all lacked, the perfect balance of hatred for sin and love for sinners. For them, it was the other way around. They hated sinners, but secretly loved their sins. Secretly, they knew that Jesus was all that they should be. But a bad combination of pride and secret sin made it necessary for them to put him to death. Are we listening? Be real quiet. That's what David said in the Psalms. Selah. Remember seeing that in the Psalms? Pause. Stop. Listen. Think about it. Meditate upon it before you say a word. Listen for what? Listen for the deeper meaning of it all. Listen for the ring of truth and balance. Listen for the voice of God. That's not an easy thing to do always. It's easy to become opinionated and mean-spirited, especially in these days with so many voices and so much noise. Have you been hearing the noises, the voices and the noise? A lot of it isn't there. It's difficult to be real quiet and listen. Some are calling for higher standards of obedience and holiness. And from the left, some are calling for more mercy and faith and love. And some say, accept others regardless of what they are, how they live their lives. Now a question for you. What does really, what does really matter to God in the big picture? As your head follows your ears to the right and to the left, shh. It's not as loud as the other voices, but it's more fervent. It's deeper and more penetrating. The voice seems, to, seems only to whisper in the background of a shouting match. A whisper, not because it's weak, but only because it's meant to be heard only by those who will listen and be quiet. Still small voice. You remember Elijah had, had, was given some instruction about that. Still, small voice. What does the voice say as it whispers? Does it add invitation to the strident, challenge to overcome sin from the right, or does it plea for mercy that we hear from the left? I'd like to read a couple of verses. I invite you to turn with me to Isaiah, the 30th chapter in verse 21. Isaiah 30, verse 21. I've just started reading Isaiah again. It's a, it's a tremendously powerful book and many places is very hard to be understood. It's one of the many, it's, a, it's the gospel prophet. Isaiah was the gospel prophet. He's uh, part of the great prophecy of the Old Testament pointing forward to the Messiah. Isaiah 30, verse 21. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way. Walk you in it when you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left. And then Deuteronomy 5 verse 32, right there near the front of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'm glad there's so many Bibles this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 5. And verse 32, you shall observe to do therefore 
as the Lord has commanded. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the what? Left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Lord God has commanded you, and that you may live, that it may be well with you, that you may prolong your days in the land which you shall possess. You know the good King Josiah, you remember hearing about him, right? It is said of him that he never went to the right or to the left. And guess what happened? God blessed him and prospered him. Wow. Don't go to the right, it says, and don't go to the left, but walk straight forward in the word. Don't emphasize justice to the exclusion of people. I want to say that again. Don't emphasize justice. What is justice? <laughs> it's being right about things, right? <laughs> Don't employ justice to the exclusion of people. There's a whole world of people out there, aren't there? And many of them have not heard the good news. Don't minimize mercy. I believe these are the building blocks of God's temple. Justice and mercy. Don't fail to get hung up on obedience to, my, to the law that you fail to abide in his love. They seem to be like opposites. Don't get so focused on love that you miss the importance of obedience. Because obedience is our expression of love. There's a wonderful definition of love in Romans. Let's turn to Romans, the 13th chapter. Romans chapter 13. This is probably the best definition of love. We've read it from this desk several times. Romans chapter 13, verses 8 to 10. I want us all to see this. This is the definition of love. Love is a thing of the heart, right? Love comes from the heart. It's not from an outward compulsion, but it's something that happens in the heart. So Romans chapter 13, verse 8. It says, no man, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has what? Fulfill the law. That's the law from the heart, right? Fulfill the obedience from the heart. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill for the neighbor to his neighbor. Therefore, love is what? Love is the fulfilling of the law. Wow. What does a still small voice ask us to do? John 14, 15 says, if you what? Love me, keep my commandments. Those two ideas go together. Titus 2, 11 to 16, we just read that. We won't take the time to do it again. 2 to 15, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's in the bulletin. I had it wrong in my notes. It's 2 to 15. Titus chapter 2. Looking for that blessed hope. That's what we're looking for, right? And the great appearing of, and the, and the, the appearing of Jesus. But the still small voice calls for a grace that transforms. Be a part of the miracle that God points, that God holds out to us every day. The miracle of a changed heart, right? Galatians 5, verse 5 and 6. Galatians is one of those short books, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right after Corinthians. Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Do you have it? Verses 5 and 6. It says, For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of the righteousness by what? Faith. That's one of these places where righteousness by faith is mentioned in the Bible. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision, but faith that does what? That works by love. Faith that works. 
The still small voice asks for a faith that will work. Give yourself to Jesus, and grace and faith are, the, are as plenteous as the, as the air that we breathe. What else? John chapter 8, verses 8 to 11. John chapter 8, verses 8 to 11. John chapter 8, 8 to 11. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. You all know the story. And they which heard it were convicted of their, in, by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning as the eldest, at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those who are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and do what? So no more. You know, <clears throat> that, that's a powerful statement. And we need to take that very seriously, just like the mercy side, right? He was having mercy and forgiveness. His heart was filled with forgiveness and compassion for her. And then he tells her, go and sin no more. What an idea that is. The voice asks us to forgive. And as we forgive others, leave off those hurts that people do to us so that we are, so that they are empowered. If somebody does, some, does something wrong to you and you take it as an offense, forgive them. Be nice to them so that they can be empowered to obey without the feeling of guilt. That's how we treat people. You know, there are three things that the Bible enjoins us to do. The first one is to forgive our enemies. Anybody tried that lately? Secondly, forgive 70 times seven. And the third one is give your heart to Jesus every day. That includes all of it, doesn't it? Give your heart to him in the morning. Make that your first work. Listen carefully to the voice of God. It does not merely call to obedience as the voices from the far right. It doesn't merely call for that. Merely, I say. Nor does that, this voice seek to stimulate our emotions with a sentimental love such as we hear from the far left. And we might call that cheap grace. The voice is unique and unmistakable. It calls for a hatred for sin and a love for those who are sinners. You know, this is a, this is a, sometimes can be a difficult walk for us, can't it? The spirit whispers of a love that by virtue of its own power creates within us a heart that wants to obey the will of God for the sake of Jesus. Love is the horsepower behind love. I'll say that again. Love is the horsepower behind love. It is what the character of God is like. Strict obedience to the law, yes, and plenteous mercy for those who are unfortunate. Self-renouncing, self-sacrificing love. Desire of Ages talks about that kind of love. Self-renouncing, self-sacrificing love. There is a statement in Desire of Ages that goes like this. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Often his way was made unnecessarily severe because he was willing and uncomplaining. In the Sabbath school class, we talked about that this morning a little bit. That's not weakness, right? It takes great strength to fulfill that kind of, a, of an example. That's what true obedience is. The Spirit does not coax us to obedience, but rather calls us to a close look at Jesus for our acceptance with God. I want to say that again, because maybe this is not well understood. The Spirit does not coax us to obedience, but he rather calls us to a close look at Jesus. When we see him and what his character is like, guess what will happen? We'll develop a love for him, and that love translates to obedience. If you love me, keep my, keep my commandments, right? Sometimes we got the cart before the horse. That doesn't work very good, does it? Anybody try that lately? <clears throat> it doesn't work for me. 
That's how we can, that's how we learn to love. The kind of love that fulfills the law. It's not that we do something for God so that he can do something for me. That's selfish. In fact, that's really kind of pagan, isn't it? We don't do something good for God by obeying in order that he can do something good for me. No, that's the wrong way around. That's the definition of legalism. Martin Luther once said, any act of supposed obedience that does not come from the heart is legalism. Uh, and where does the heart religion come from? By a long, steady gaze to Jesus. Spend some time every day searching the word because this is really a Jesus book, is that right? And we learn to know him. Study the word for the purpose of knowing him. Not to win some argument, but of knowing him whom to know is eternal life. The right way around in this cart and horse idea is found in Romans chapter 3. Let's take a look at that. Romans, the third chapter. And we're going to get done on time today. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. If you, if you found it, say amen. amen. 3 verse 20 says, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 24, Being justified freely. Now I have, I think in the Revised Standard, one of the virgins I have at home, it says without cause. Being justified without cause. What does justified mean? It means to be judged righteous before the law, right? Set right before the law. It says being justified freely without cause. What does that mean? It means that there's no real reason why, why he should do it, except that he loves us very, very much. This is all an act of grace on his part. Just verse 24 again being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And then it caps off in uh, verse 26 to 28. Notice this, 26 to 28. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. He can be just, and yet he can forgive us totally and completely. And it takes the cross to really understand that. He's just because he took the penalty for sin, stern justice on the cross, right? And yet he, by that act, has opened the floodgates of mercy to all of us so that we can have, so that we can be justified believers. Verse 27, where's boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Does that mean the law is not important? important? No, we just read that the law points us to where? A need of a savior. We see what we are. It's like a mirror that shows our dirty face, right? So that we can, so that we can do something about it. And the only thing we can do about it is look to Jesus. You know, in 1888, they had some, they had some information about this. And one person in authority said, if we, do, if we really believe this, we'll destroy our message. How so could that be? I'll have to tell you, nobody can really keep the law without love in his heart that comes from a long, hard look at Jesus every day. This is a daily thing. This is the gospel in a nutshell. God's character is at issue here. See how God treats people fully in the knowledge that they will not respond to his love. He treats everybody alike, to the just and the unjust, fully knowing that many will not accept his love. That's unselfish, isn't it? In other words, he would, get, he would not get the benefit in return. That's the nature of God's love. He spreads grace around for the whole world to be saved, and only a few people will get it like the broken alabaster box in uh, the experience that Jesus had in Simon's house. It filled the whole room immediately. It's like the grace of God. 
The, the spirit of prophecy says the grace of God is as, is as plentiful as the air that we breathe. Think about that one for a minute. There is a wonderful passage in Ezekiel chapter 16. Lamont, you know about this one. Ezekiel chapter 16. This is a wonderful story just to contemplate. We won't read the whole story here, but just a few verses. <clears throat> God did not accept the Jewish nation because they were a great people or a wonderful people. When he found them, there weren't much. Notice Ezekiel chapter 16. And let's read from verses 6 and then 8 to 10. Chapter 6, Dean, verses 8, verse 8. Now when I passed by you and looked upon you, behold, the time, the time, that behold, your, that behold your time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. Yea, I swore to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God, and you were mine, and you became mine. And verse 8, verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, you know, I want to read verse 6 first. <laughs> Let's go back to verse 6. When I passed by you, here's God talking now to his people. When I passed by you and saw you polluted in your own blood, I, saw to you, I, I said to you when you were in your blood, live. Yea, I said to you when you were in your blood, live. In other words, can you get the picture of this little baby cast away by her mother out in the wilderness? Her navel was uncut. She was still covered with blood, and the Lord comes by, and in his mercy and patience, he begins to wash and, 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 and apply oil to that skin as this baby is about ready to die. And then verse 9 and 10, when I washed you with water, yea, I, washed, I thoroughly washed you away your blood from you, and I anointed, anointed you with oil. And verse 10, I clothed you also with embroidered work and shod you with badger skin, and I girded you about with fine linen and covered you with silk. You know, that's how he finds all of us, right? We're kind of in that condition all the time when we, when we first come into, come into an understanding of things. And then uh, we might take a little look at Psalms 86. Psalm 86, back a few pages to the left. Psalm chapter 86. Psalm 86, and I want to read 11 to 17. It says, this is a prayer of David. Teach me your way, O Lord, I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, for with all my, what does it say? Well, this is heart work. With all my heart, I will glorify your name forevermore. For great is your mercy toward me, and you have delivered my soul from the lowest hell. O oh God, the proud are risen against me, and the assemblies of the violent men have sought after my soul and have not set you before them. But you, O oh Lord, are God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous, plenteous in mercy and truth. O oh, turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give, give your strength to your servant and save, the son, and save the son of your handmaid. Show me the token, a token for good that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. I have to tell you, this is a messianic prophecy also. This is really the experience of Jesus. Uh, David had these kind of experiences, but this is how what Jesus went through. The voice of the Holy Spirit makes no demands for heartless reform that leaves the soul void of any sense of divine love. Luther once said, it's legalism if the religion is not from the heart. Nor will the Holy Spirit offer a cheap grace that winks at sin. Remember, not to the right, 
not to the left. This is a complete message of salvation. But the grace he offers will be so free, so accepting, so absolutely unmerited that all who truly perceive and receive, perceive and receive will be changed by that very grace. He finds us in one way, but he doesn't leave us that way, does he? This is a grace that works. It's the same whisper voice that animated Jesus day by day. Jesus healed the sin problem on two levels, by conquering its guilt and conquering the power of sin. Secondly, by offering forgiveness so full and free that people were made victorious in their forgiveness. You know, the people we rub shoulders with too, forgive them, why forgive them? So that they'll be relieved of the guilt and have a victorious life too. No one can truly obey unless, unless they are touched by the grace of God, his mercy and his forgiveness. The Lord is not asking us to choose between justice and mercy, between law and grace, nor between love and obedience. He's not asking us to choose between forgiveness and victory, nor between faith and works, but he's calling us to a faith that works by love. There's a difference. Again and again, the Bible message is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, all, you and your whole house. Believe is used again and again. They entered not in because of what? Unbelief. Unbelief. The battle cry of the Reformation was by faith alone. Faith in what? Faith always has an object, right? And who is the object in this situation? Jesus. We can only have faith in him as we look to him through his word every day. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how we learn to know Jesus. If we're walking a tightrope, we need a balancing rod, lest we fall off to one side of the precipice or to the other. A balancing rod, grace has its function. It's the, it is the, it's the rod to release us from condemnation by revealing God's forgiveness, causes us to be grateful and forgiving to others. Grace brings a strong love for Jesus, which in turn causes a great burden-free obedience. Oh, how I love thy law. It's my meditation all the day, David said. That's how we get that. Pardon is not caused by obedience, but obedience springs from pardon. Let me read that again. Pardon is not caused by our obedience. We can't obey and obey and obey and obey and have forgiveness from that, right? Or pardon. But obedience springs from pardon. Beginning to realize how much Jesus has done in order for us to have salvation will break the heart. Fall on the rock, it says. Don't let the rock fall on you, but fall on the rock. Jesus is the rock. It's the goodness and grace of God that leads to repentance. Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Obedience is not the Savior. We're not saved by works, neither are true believers without works. There will always be works there. He doesn't leave us like the, way we, the way he founds us. He changes us so that we become more and more like Jesus every day, so we'll be ready when he comes. So we can stretch our hands heavenward and say, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. Jesus is the Savior, who by saving grace wins our hearts to eager obedience. Have any of you ex experienced that a little bit? Sometimes you have been studying about Jesus and you're, you're just, you're just uh, the Holy Spirit is working with your heart and you want to eagerly obey, right? I've experienced that. And we can all do that. And that can become more and more the norm as we walk this pathway. Shut out every other voice each day. Open your Bible and with a, with a prayer for guidance and conviction and understanding and listen to the still small voice. This can't be done by just a, a quick opening of the Bible and two or three minutes later we go, go on to something else. This takes some planning. We make choices every day. This is a good choice to make. Do it in the morning. 
that's probably the best time when, I know when I come home in the evening sometimes, I have, I have I've been working through the day, I've been giving Bible studies and talking to people, I come home at night and I'm exhausted. Maybe it's partly due to my age, I don't know. But it's not the time for me to sit down and study the Bible. In the morning at the beginning. Ministry of Healing, page 58 says, when every other voice is hushed and in quietness, we wait before him. The silence of the soul makes more distinct the voice of God. This morning, as we close the service, we're going to sing about that. We sung about it in Sabbath school also. Did you notice that? Faith is the victory. Did you notice the opening song of Sabbath school was Faith is the Victory? Faith is the victory. That's our appeal today. Pray for it as you read the Bible. As you spend time in the Bible, be praying and a prayerful exercise it, and mountains of doubts and discouragement will be moved out of the way, making room for obedience. We can't truly obey if we never know that we're really forgiven, right? Is forgiveness full and complete in Jesus? Of course it is. This is the righteousness of God. I want to read one more text. It's Romans 1, 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. You all have read this before. Many of you can, can quote it. Romans 1, 16 and 17. I entitled my sermon today, The Righteousness of God. That's the goal, isn't it? That's what Jesus was. He was the righteousness of God. Romans 1, 16 and 17. Notice this verse says, from faith to faith. A faith that we have today to a greater faith and deeper faith tomorrow, from faith to faith. Romans 1, 16. <clears throat> it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. It's the what? The power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in the gospel, in other words, right? That's what he's talking about, the subject here. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it, is, as it is written. The just shall live by what? Faith. Faith translates to righteousness. That's why believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your whole house. Let's pray. Dear Father, I want to pray for each one of us here today that we might have a new, new commitment to you. Please bring revival and reformation in our midst. Make our lives the lives of victory, Lord, that stems from a constant gaze upon your face. We pray this morning that you will be with each one here according to our several needs. Help us in our witness to others, and we look forward to his soon coming. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.